Whew, praise the Lord. That was, that was very powerful. Thank you, Jeff. Lori. It is, it is well. Wow. Yes. The preacher just needs a moment. All right. Hold on just a second. Woo. That was awesome. Thank you. Mm. I don't know if you people online could, could feel that or, or experience that, that worship, uh, but it was, it was very Holy Spirit palpable in, in the room and just want to. Good. All right. We do welcome you, and we're glad you're here. My name is Danny Forsheed, pastor at Great Hills uh, Baptist Church, and also get to teach at our other campus up in North at Liberty Hill at Connect Church. And we're delighted that you're here, both here in, in the room and also those of you that are worshiping the Lord with us. And I know many of you are because uh, you told me you were because you're not feeling well or traveling or whatever, and we're glad that you can tune in uh, with us. Uh, we're in a study in the book of Acts, and I want to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 21, thankful amidst the struggle is the title of our message, Acts 21, 27 through 40. Church, this is a milestone for us. We're actually going to finish a chapter in the book of Acts, which is pretty, pretty amazing. You know, Acts chapter 21, there are 28 chapters, and I'm quite sure this year we are going to finish the book of Acts. I, I believe it. I believe it's going to happen uh, next week's going to be a phenomenal service. Can't wait for next Sunday, our Mission Sunday. Becky Dean will be helping us and leading us. I'll be here and participating. I'm excited about that. And then the next week, we'll kick off a trilogy of sermons. I'm calling them uh, Christmas Messages and Grace, Peace, and Joy. Looking forward to sharing those messages with you. Then after the first of the year, we'll come back to Acts chapter 22. But for now, Acts chapter 21, the title again is Thankful in the Midst of uh, our struggle. Um, as Jeff prayed a moment ago, the Apostle Paul is, is such a hero to us. Uh, his life is unveiled for us in the Word of God. Uh, he is a man on a mission. His mission is to preach the gospel to as many people as he possibly can. His goal is to honor the Lord and finish, finish well. The year, and this is really important, the year is about A.D. 57, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and why that's so significant. But A.D. 57 is the year. The Apostle Paul has made his way to Jerusalem. Now, those of you that are new, and I'm gonna be sensitive because I know lots of people join in this study as we're midway through or toward the end. And, and let me just welcome you in. He's finishing up his third missionary journey of four. It's about A.D. 57. It's the year of Pentecost celebrating Pentecost. Jerusalem is jam-packed with people. There are people from all over the world who've come to Jerusalem to worship, uh, to remember the harvest, but also to commemorate Moses' giving of the law. And so they are there. It is an electric time. It's an exciting time. The Apostle Paul has come off of his missionary journey. He has given a report to the church of Jerusalem. The church of Jerusalem has exploded in growth. There are about, I don't know how many thousands. I've, I've heard as many as at the end of just a couple of centuries, there, there's as many as 250,000 people uh, who are worshiping the Lord just in Jerusalem, not to mention all over uh, uh, the known world or the Roman world. And the Apostle Paul comes back. He gives a report as to what has happened. And then he shares uh, an offering with them. They have taken up an offering and given it to the church at Jerusalem. And thank you, Church at Great Hills, for taking up such a generous offering last Sunday to go toward our harvest offering, toward the end of the year giving, which I know many of you continue to give as a harvest offering all the way through the end of December, and that's fantastic. We need it. We appreciate it. We want to finish 2022 in a strong way. It's, it's a longer text. I'm going to read it, and I just want you to pick up with me, engage with me as we read the Word of God. What a privilege it is as we look at a text that Apostle Paul, his life is on display, and he is going to be thankful he is going to seize the opportunity that God gives him in the midst of tremendous struggle. I don't know if you ever had anybody lay their hands on you as an adult. I don't know if you've ever had anybody physically with such anger gr literally grab you as, as an adult and, and begin to beat you. And this is what is going to happen to the Apostle Paul. And were it not for God's intervening sovereignty, 
Uh, A.D. 57 would be the end of the Apostle Paul, but it's just A.D. 57. All right, let's read the text. Uh, here we go. Acts chapter 21, I'll pick up in verse, in verse 27, all right? Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on Paul. And they cried out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people. The law and this place, meaning the temple. And furthermore, this guy, Paul, has brought Greeks. Oh, shudder the thought. He has brought Greeks into the temple and he has defiled this holy place. Some serious accusations against the apostle Paul. Verse 29, Luke parenthetically says, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And all the city was disturbed. How much of the city was disturbed, church? All the city. That's not hyperbole. I mean, that's, the city is in an uproar, in a tumult. I mean, public order has been set aside. I mean, they are, they're in an uproar with this. And all the city was disturbed. And the people ran ahead and seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were closed. They were shut. Now, just stay with me. We're going to go back through every verse. We're going to talk it through, but just get the general idea for what's happening right now. Paul's in trouble, okay? Let me just say, he's in a lot of trouble. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, tumult. He immediately took soldiers and centurions, centurions, plural. A centurion is over 100 men, now, if it's centurion plural, there's at least a minimum of how many men? Of 200 men. The cohort would consist of 1,000 Roman soldiers local, located on the northwest corner of Antonius Fortress. I'll show you a picture in just a moment. Antonius Fortress, built by Herod the Great in honor of Mark Antony, the Romans were there for just this reason. Because the Jews have been known to revolt and cause some issues, and so they are there, and they hear, oh no, there's an uproar, and they were seeking to kill him. And news came to the commander of the garrison, all Jerusalem and uproar, and here they come. He immediately took soldiers and centurions, and they ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, well, they quit beating Paul. Beating Paul. Just wrap your mind around that for just a moment. This man of God, faithful missionary, great theologian, author of a whole lot of the New Testament, is beaten for his faith. And then the commander came near and took Paul and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked him who he was. Who are you and what have you done? That's, that's basically what is happening. You're definitely guilty. All these people hate you. Who are you? What have you done? And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out these words, away with him. Just remember, 27 years before this, almost the same location, they said the same thing about somebody else. Away with him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And here Paul is, in the same city, in the same predicament as Christ was almost three decades before. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, how dare you allow this to happen to me? I mean, he didn't do that. He said these words, can I speak to you? <laughs> he replied, can you speak Greek? Because Paul's speaking Greek to him. Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? And Paul said to him, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, translation of no insignificant city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them. He spoke to them in the Hebrew language and Aramaic, and he said, and he preaches his sermon. The Apostle Paul is in a predicament. 
He finds himself in a difficult way. Why? Has he done anything wrong? No. In fact, he's done everything God has asked him to do. In fact, Jesus has commissioned him to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles and see Gentiles, people like us, right? You're the Jew or a Gentile. Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. It's causing issues in the church of Jerusalem, and especially it's causing issues among the Jews and Judaism there at the capital city. You know, whenever we find ourselves in situations like this, we have, we have one or two options before us. We can panic uh, or, or we can pray. We can become very defensive and angry or we can rely upon the Lord and seek God in the midst uh, of our suffering. And Paul is just such a beautiful example here. And I, as I study his life, I, I'll probably say this a couple times today, I, I watch him and the way he responds to the situation and it's so different than the way I would respond to the situation. I would become very defensive. I'd be ready to fight. I'd be ready to plead my case, you know, and Paul's just, he has this, this wherewithal about him. He, he is so able to just be in the moment, trusting in God, knowing that God is going to take care of him. I've been following the life of a, of a man I'm very interested in, and, uh, and, and I've been watching him from a distance. His name is Timothy Keller. Many of you have read Timothy Keller. He's the pastor. He was the pastor of a Presbyterian church there in Manhattan called Redeemer Presbyterian. How many of y'all ever heard of him or read any of his? It's pretty amazing. Now, his books, The Reason for God and The Prodigal God, have sold, I think, a couple of million copies each. Very prolific author. He pastored this church. They ran about 5,000 people, and, and he stepped down after 28 years of ministry in this church. And now he is serving in different capacities. He's mentoring lots of students, and he's gone into a different season of life two years ago. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I've been reading him just this week as I was preparing this sermon and going over my message, and I was watching the life of Tim Keller as he was just revealing, kind of like Paul in this, in this crucible, in this circumstance, you know, not asking for it, but it's come to it, like some of you. I mean, some of you on this holiday weekend, you, you find yourself with some suffering, with some difficulty, with some pressure. Look, you didn't ask for it, and you think you don't even really deserve it, but it's yours. And, and you have an opportunity here to embrace it and give it back to the Lord or become very bitter. And here's what Tim Keller has done. He has chosen to say, God, I don't understand this. God, I really want more years to serve you and live for you. But Lord, I have this cancer. And God, I, I want you to help me and get me through it. And it's something interesting he said. He said, you know, I've held the hands of people as a pastor, and I've been into the hospice situations and hospitals, and I've literally watched people take their last breath, but I was totally unprepared for this because he said, I'm seeing my mortality face to face. I do recommend his book, The Prodigal God. In this book, he says, whatever you do, Christian, don't become bitter when your trial comes. Don't become angry with God don't become angry with yourself, but trust in God even in the midst of the struggle. He said, if you, if you choose not to, here's what will happen. You will become the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. He says, the first sign that you are an elder brother spirit is when your life doesn't go as you want. You are not just sorrowful, but you're deeply angry and bitter. When life doesn't go the way you want, you're not just sorrowful, but you're very angry and bitter. If you feel that you have not been good enough or evil things have happened, then you're going to swing between the two poles of I hate thee or I hate me, end of quote, but not Paul. I look at his life and I'm just swept up in the tide of his, his maturity and his walk with, with Christ. And so today, I want to walk through the text with you. The first thing I want to explore with you is the suffering that Paul is experiencing. Uh, it is intense. Uh, he goes to the temple. Remember last week, if you were here, if not, let me, let me just catch you up. The Apostle Paul has been accused of hating his own people, right? Hating the law, hating the temple, hating the Jews, and even bringing now a Gentile within the inner sanctum of the temple area. It's like, oh my goodness, what is happening? And so Paul comes in and he, he acquiesces. He allows himself uh, to do what James the elder and the other pastors there in the church of Jerusalem, they said, Paul, we got this idea, if you would, take these Jews 
who were taking the Nazarite vow, go with them to the temple. If you go with them to the temple and pay their sacrifices and, and they pay to have their hair cut and, and there's this whole Nazarite, Nazarite vow that they're taking, then everybody will see Paul associated with Judaism and then all of your critics will know, hey, Paul is not against us as Jews. Yes, he has become a Christian, but he has not thrown out his Judaism. He, he still loves us. He still respects us. Paul, if you'll do this, trust me, if you'll do this, then people will say and they will see, go, okay, Paul is still okay. Okay, he's still with us. So Paul goes, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> oh my word. He goes from the frying pan to the fire. He goes into the temple and when he is performing this, this ceremony, you know, people are watching him and then it just, it just breaks loose. Let me explain again, like I did last week. The reason Paul is going through this litany of, of sacrifices and ceremonies and Nazarite law he said, I will, look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter nine, I love this. He says, to the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win them. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To the weak, he said, I will become weak. I will do anything and everything possible that I might win them. I have become, what does it say? Some things, I've become all things to all people that I might by somehow, some means save them. So here he is in verse 27, and the Jews from Ephesus come. Remember, Paul spends three years in Ephesus. They have made the journey from, <laughs> from Ephesus, Turkey, modern day Turkey. They've made their way all the way to Jerusalem. And I can't help but think they've made their way there because they know Paul's gonna be there and this may be an opportunity for them to seize him and to have him not only persecuted, but, but killed. And so they cry out, they say, oh no, Paul, you have done the following things. And here they are, these four things. Number one, you're anti-Semitic. You no longer care for the Jewish people. Number two, you oppose the law. That is very inflammatory. Remember, this is the Feast of Pentecost. At the Feast of Pentecost, there are thousands of Jews here, people. And they're not just celebrating you know, the, the harvest, they're celebrating the giving of the law at Pentecost and they're accusing Paul of hating the law. Number three, of hating the temple. Now this may be the most severe one. They are in the temple precinct. They're accusing Paul of downplaying the importance of the temple. Now remember, that's what they said about Jesus and they crucified him. That's what they said about Stephen and they crucified him. Y'all, they are building this up. They have murder on their mind. They are trumping up these cases against Paul because they want to eliminate him. And fourthly, they said, you, uh, you have taken a, a, a Gentile and you've placed him in the holy temple. Now, the temple back then looked like this. There was a court for the Gentiles, okay? And then when you move out of this court of the Gentiles, you would come into what is known as the court of the Jewish women. Now, there was a sign between the court of the Jewish women and the Gentiles that said, basically, if you're a Gentile, you're gonna get killed if you cross this threshold. And it literally said that, and the Romans gave the Jews the right to kill any Gentile that crossed over from this precinct into this precinct. I know it's crazy. Then you would go into the court of the Jews, the males, and then you would go to the court of the priests. Then eventually you would go into the Holy of Holies. So that was the temple precinct. And here they say, Paul has brought this guy from Ephesus and this Trophimus guy, this Gentile, and they have taken him into the court of the Jewish women. Of course, that's ludicrous. Paul would never do that. He would never sentence his friend Trophimus to an untimely death, but it doesn't matter when there is a mob, right? Mob rule. I mean, mob, people are just in a frenzy and they are out for blood and they're ready to take Paul, and this was an intense time of suffering for him. Verse 30, it gets even more intense if you're following along in the scripture, uh, that people begin to grab him and seize him, and now Paul's life is hanging in the balance. What is going to happen to him? Let me give you a little pop test. Uh, what year is it uh, in the life of Paul right now? AD 50. Seven. Can I just go ahead and say it? I've been wanting to say this for a long time. Paul will not die until AD 67. He's still got a lot of the Bible to write. 
He still has to travel to Rome and preach the gospel. He, he still got a lot of life and ministry in him. So I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. Anybody can do anything that they wanna do, but if it's not your time, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No disease, no man, no war, nothing can take you when you're walking with the Lord and the Lord has his hand on you and God in his sovereign providential mind says, it's not your time. But look out, but when it is your time, <laughs> no medicine, no nothing, no prayers, nothing's gonna help you because God says, it's time, come on home. Paul is in the sovereign hand of God. He can say, it is well with my soul. That's how he can get up and say, oh, can I preach y'all a sermon? I'm like, what in the world? He wants to preach a sermon. They've, they've laid hands on him. They're gonna kill him. He would say to us today, don't worry about it. I'm good. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not fearing any evil because God is with me. His right hand is comforting me. My God's gonna take me all the way home when it's time. Y'all chill out. Don't worry about it. I'd be freaking out. People laying hands on me, Lord, get their hands off of me. Oh, they're trying to kill me. Oh, my Lord, what in the world? Paul's like, it's good. Dude, man, I want to get there. I'm not there. I want to be where he is in that walk with God, in that serene, peaceful tranquility. Lord, my life is yours. If it is time, here I come. But if it's not time, Lord, you'll take care of this. This is why I call point number two, intervening sovereignty. The sovereignty of God, verse 31, reaches down. How in the world did they get the word to the commander? But they did. The word got to him because of the shouting and, and the mob violence. I think we have a picture of the um, Antonius Fortress, if I can show it to you real quick. This is a, a, obviously a rendering. If you go to the northwest corner, now all this is the temple precinct, and in the middle of it, you'll see the Holy of Holies. Go where the arrow is. That's where Antonius Fortress is located. It is a conspicuous, it was, large fortress built by Herod the Great in cooperation with Rome to keep an eye out on these Jews, okay? Because they've been known to be quite violent at times, and so... The word gets out, so you can see that how they can hear about the commotion, the tumult that is happening. And so here comes the commander with his soldiers. His name is Claudius Lysias, that's his name. He is the commander in charge. A, a thousand soldiers at his disposal. One writer says, Paul's dilemma is this way, quote, he has been fiercely attacked and beaten. Another writer I read said these words, he has been terribly beaten. So when it says that they laid hands on Paul, I mean, they were beating this man. They had taken him out of the court of the Jewish women. Y'all with me right here? They had taken him into the court of the Gentiles and they closed the door. They closed the door and they began to pound this man within an inch of his life. Commotion, the uproar, they hear it. The commander Lysias, he takes his at least 200 of his men and they rush into the scene. Verse 33, Lysias bound Paul with chains. They, he assumes that he's definitely guilty, right? Because why else are all these people so mad? Verse 34, it's chaos, confusion, mayhem. Verse 35, you can see the scene. I can see it in my mind's eye. It's very volatile, it's very hostile. And here they take Paul and they lead him up those stairs. I showed you a moment ago that, that fortress and they're trying to get him away from the, from the crowd. Where's God? Where's the Lord? I mean, his servant is, is about dead. When, when will God come through? When, when will God intervene? Well, he will, but God is just going to intervene in his own time. When we were in Asia just a couple of weeks ago, I, <laughs> I know I'm not crazy because Tom was thinking the same thing. If, if he's thinking it and I'm thinking, maybe we're both crazy, but we both were thinking we're, we're about 
to experience something we do not want to experience. We were in Asia, I can't tell you the country, and we came upon a traffic jam. And I don't know how long we stayed in traffic for about an, probably about an hour. And you could feel the temperature of the people. It was right, they were getting angry. You can hear the shouts and people were getting mad. Y'all, they don't have any red lights. There's, there, it's just mayhem. It's just total confusion. And our driver decides he's gonna go through a one way and jump in line and get on, get us to the hotel. And I was like, this is where I'm gonna die. They're gonna look in here and see this white haired, white dude from that part of the world. And I just, y'all, I'm not kidding you. I just put my head down. I just started praying. I said, God, please deliver us. Because if they see Tom and me in here, I just, I was just thinking the worst. Tom was too, come to find out. And I, as I relive that, preparing this message, I thought, Preaching was the last thing on my mind. I'm telling you, I don't know if y'all accuse me of just being carnal or just not being spiritual. All I know is, Lord, get me out of here. I mean, these, I could just, I could feel that people were shouting. And, and when that taxi driver, when he started heading towards them, they started hollering at him. I said, oh my word, they're about to rip me out of this car. And I was like, but Paul, they did rip him out of the car and they did beat him. And yet he had the spiritual capital and wherewithal not to panic, but to trust in the sovereignty of God. Man, woo. So we got intense suffering. That's what he's going through. You got the sovereignty of God. And I'll wrap up with this. I just love Paul's intentionality. I love the way he seizes the moment. Verse 37, he's about to be taken to the barracks. And Lysias and him have a conversation. And Paul says, can I speak to you? The spiritual composure, maturity, and wherewithal, and the intentionality to say, can I speak to you? And he's speaking Greek. So Lysias assumes that Paul, <laughs> it's, it's kind of comical, but it's, it's really not. He's thinking, wait a minute. I know who you are, and Josephus will help us fill in the blanks. Luke just writes a little bit about the assassins. There's 4,000 assassins. And what happened years before was this guy um, who, who raised, he's from Egypt, and he came into Jerusalem and he amassed the Jewish nationalists. He got a lot of the zealots on his side. They, they got out to the Mount of Olives. There were about 4,000 of them, and they were ready. They were ready to go in and, and not just attack Rome. They wanted to attack any Jew that was in proximity to or was at least um, acquiescing with Rome. And so here's, here was the plan. This is what the guy literally taught his assassins to do. They had their daggers, and they would go in the crowd like a feast at, at Pentecost, and they would, they would find out Jews who may be uh, sympathetic with the Romans and they would literally stab their countrymen and then they would do one of two things. They would pull out their dagger and take off and run or they would hide their dagger and go, oh, help. They would pretend to be one of the mourners. It's chaos. Lysias says, you're that guy. You're the guy we were looking for. You're that assassin from Egypt. And that's when Paul said, I am, I'm no Gentile, dude. I'm a Jew. And he just, set him, he just set him straight. He said, that is not me. He said, I am from Cilicia. And that, he, he said, that is no mean city. In other words, that is not an insignificant city. It's located in southern Turkey today on the Mediterranean coast. There, it, it had a library that rivaled the library of Athens and Alexandria. Athens of Europe and Alexandria of Africa there in Turkey was Cilicia. Paul is basically saying, look, I'm not some uneducated Philistine Gentile. I, I am a, a Jew and you need to know that. I mean, just again, the wherewithal that Paul could just take command of the, of the situation. And then he says, now that we've settled that, um, Is it okay if I talk to these people? I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Help me, Lord, help me. Paul, what are you doing? Listen, is it, is it okay? Uh, can, can I speak 
to these people. I know they just tried to kill me. They about beat me to death, but, but I want to share something with them. Here's what he's going to share, and we'll wait for a few weeks to go through the sermon, but basically it's Romans 10, chapter 1, and it goes something like this. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for my people is that they may be saved. Wow, what a guy, what a saint, what an example for us. Chuck Swindoll in his book on Paul says, here you have grit under pressure. Most of us would be calling our attorneys, but not Paul. He is bruised and battered and begrimed, one another author says, and he is disheveled, but he is quickly in command of the situation. In verse 40, you just see the portrait of courage and compassion, this man of God. You, you can tell a lot about a person when things don't go their way. And the more I, I parse that statement and I read that, I, the more I am, I'm convicted of that. Because if things don't go our way, then the real self, the real what's in our heart begins to come out of our mouth. And so what's in the heart of Paul and what's in the life of Paul is Jesus. He is so sold out to Christ that even when he's persecuted and even when he's beaten, he, he, he's thankful. I mean, he's just like, look, I'm gonna give thanks to God. I'm gonna give praise to God. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to tell even the people who are trying to kill me about the Lord. Can I, can I just encourage you as I close with this? If Paul, mm, mm, if Paul can do this, within an inch of his life at the fortress. Can you and I not do this in our neighborhood? Can you and I not do this in our workplace? Students, can you and I not take a stand for Christ in the university or the college or our, or our schools? Uh, my point is, if, if God's sovereign hand can intervene and help Paul and give him everything that he needs so that he can bear witness for Christ, I believe God will do the same thing for us. Whew. Some of y'all are like, that's the most unique Thanksgiving sermon I think I've ever heard. And you're, you're right. I was like, this is going to be an interesting text, Lord. You sure you want me to preach? Lord, I can't go to Psalm 100 and give us the seven reasons why we're to be thankful. And the Lord's like, you preach this. So, okay. So I did. So I preached it. And, um, you know, I, I, I watched, um, you know, I've been, been running a lot, training for this race, and I was running the other day, and I, I listened to all the, the videos of the Pastor Appreciation Month that y'all did, and amen, and uh, man, it just, it blessed me so much, and I thank y'all. So many of you did these little videos and told me you appreciate Ashley and me and our ministry, and, and one of you um, said something that, that really spoke to my heart. It all spoke to my heart, but this is what she said. She said, Pastor, you know those times when you say a lot, I don't know who this is for, but then I say it? She goes, a lot of times it's for me. So I, I don't know who this is, this is for. Maybe, maybe it's just been for me because I so want to be walking with the Lord that even when things are seemingly falling apart and the suffering is intense, but if I could just wait and see the sovereign hand of God intervene, and even in that situation to be intentional for the Lord, that's where I want to be. So I want to ask you all if you would join me in prayer as we wrap up our, our sermon part of the service and have our invitations. My, my joy to be able to share this message with you. and As we just contemplate for a few moments how the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, can I just kind of lean into that with you for a moment? Maybe you're here today and um, the elder brother, I mean, you don't get your way and whew, it gets ugly. Things come out of your mouth that are deep within the recesses of your heart and it's, it's not pretty. Instead of feeling shame and saying, I'm hopeless, I'm pitiful, I'm horrible, why don't you just say, Lord, forgive me, and please help me. I, I want to do better. How about that? I like that. Lord, I'm sorry. Would, would you please help me? And, and I, wanna, I want to do better. That would be an awesome response. This whole sermon would be worth it 
If I knew that you would have that conversation with the Lord today and to say, Lord, I'm not where I need to be. Um, and it's revealed oftentimes in the crucible of pain and temptation and suffering. But Lord, thank you that you don't leave me there, that you love me too much to do that. You're maturing me and helping me grow and mature in my walk with you. Thank you, Lord. Please help me, Lord, that in those situations, when I'm tempted or even when I'm hurt, that I would not lash out or become defensive, but Lord, I would actually have the spiritual wherewithal to share the gospel. Woo, wouldn't that be awesome? Maybe you're here today and you listen to a message like this, you retrace the life of a saint like Paul and you're like, oh my word, what is this? Is this Christianity? Is this what it means to be a follower of Christ so that you, you have that kind of spirituality that, that you can face life and death in a situation like that and you can have peace? Yep, that's it. This is the life. This is the life that only Jesus can offer. And it's yours and it's mine for the taking. And it just begins with a simple, ooh, Lord, I need you. Anybody like that here today? My, my head is bowed and my eyes are closed, but I'm gonna say it again. Woo, Lord, I need you. I wonder if you'd say that today. Some of you for the very first time with humility and with conviction say, Lord, I need you. I really do. I've been trying to do this thing on my own called life and it's not working out very good. And Lord, I'm gonna ask you to help me. I'm gonna ask you to save me. Lord, I want you to come into my life right here, right now on Thanksgiving, holiday, hallelujah, 2022. Jesus, come into my heart. I invite you to do that right, right here and right now. We're gonna have an invitation. We're gonna stand in a moment. We're gonna sing a song. We're gonna greet one another and pray with each other. And we would love to meet you and greet you and pray for you if you'll come. And let us do that. Let us have that moment with you this morning. That's why our pastors, I wanna go ahead and invite them, you pastors and our staff and deacons, if y'all make your way on up here and just help us and maybe just come and pray and just welcome people as we, as we gather uh, around the word of God, around the cross of Jesus, as we, the church, be the church. Maybe you're broken, maybe you're hurting, maybe you just, oh, maybe you're like, oh, that message was for me and I, man, I need prayer, I need help, I need encouragement. You come. Father, we thank you for your word. It is life, God. It is, what a joy it is to read it, to preach it. And now, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live it. Would you give us that strength, oh God, we pray. Lord, I am praying. I'm praying for souls, Lord. I'm praying for men and women, for students, for boys and girls, Lord, for senior adults, for middle-aged people, for all people that don't know Christ, that today would be a day of salvation. Lord, the day. They give their lives to you. I'm inviting you. I'm praying for you to do that. And I'm also praying for your church, Lord, to be strengthened, to be encouraged. This is your people, God. It's not my church, Jesus. This is your church. These are your people. And I'm just their shepherd. I just get to encourage them and love them and walk with them. Lord, move in this situation. Lord, move in our invitation. Move in our circumstance, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I do invite you to stand and God bless you as you stand in a spirit of reverence and prayer. Many of you, some of you want to come. You come and you kneel or talk to one of our pastors. God bless you as you come.